you know what? It's not so bad. Living on a desert island, there isn't any signal, so you never need to charge your phone. You know what? I grow a beard. And as an MP in the House of Commons, with socialist principles, you're used to feeling on your own. I've got the allotment going I'm not sure what it's going to grow But whatever it is It'll make jam You know what? I like the beard Nobody's homeless and we don't have trident It's a bit like Liverpool Nobody reads the sun. We agree a manifesto. And although it's not exactly Highbury, it's always Tottenham nil here. Island Rovers won and... I've got the allotment going. I'm not sure what it's going to grow. But whatever it is, It'll make jam. You know what? There's jam for all. And refugees are welcome here. Then one day I wake up. The desert islands disappeared. So, was it all just a dream? The mango jam and the manifesto. Like a message in a jam jar, gone. I've still got the beard I've got the allotment going I'm not sure what it's going to grow But whatever it is It'll make Jam for all Welcome to Cast Away with Corbin, and uh, we are joined uh, today by the uh, special guest is none other than uh, Jeremy Corbin. Are you here, Jeremy? Here I am, holding a jar of jam, ready for you. Uh, fantastic. Um, and um, what's that? Grape and apple? Does it say grape and apple? It's called rustic grape and apple because. I've got a new system that I, th I think there's a lot of nutrition in apple skin. So you wash the apples, then cut them very small to make the basis for the jam. And then I add grapes from the grapes from the vine in my back garden. And I make with it what I call rustic grape and apple jam. And it's beautiful. Fantastic. Um, Even though I'm going to tell myself. And, uh, and so look, you're, we've got a really, uh, you, you've been really kind and, and sent in all your favourite uh, pieces of music and some books as well. Well, not all of them, there's far too many, but it was actually a pretty tough choice, uh, sort of boiling it down to eight, very hard. Well, we, we've, got, we've got nine um, now. Well, that's what I mean, you boil it down to eight and get nine, it's okay. Absolutely. Okay, right, Let, let's, let's, let's get cracking. So um, what we heard, on the uh, intro was uh, Rob Johnson. Uh, he, he's he wrote a special song, uh, especially for the show, uh, which he does every week. But he he's uh, he's written a special song for you in which he speaks about um, obviously jam, but also um, the the thing about Arsenal. Are you you're not one of these Arsenal fans who relishes Tottenham losing, are you? I'm an Arsenal fan. I'm, I'm always positive, and so I'm just pleased when Arsenal win and a little disappointed in uh, their performance last weekend. They managed to get a player sent off and then started playing well and uh, got a doughty draw out of a pretty drab evening when they were heading for defeat. So, you know, but oh, it's, well. um, it's, all, it's one of those things. Uh, I, my other team is Forest Green Rovers oh, uh, because they're sort of... Um, Dale Vince has got them as a vegetarian, vegan type team with a wooden stadium. And we did a rally in the stadium during the election. And um, Hector Bellerin 
who's an Arsenal player and an excellent chap all round, uh, has now given some of his money towards Forest Green Rovers. And the other thing he does is every time Arsenal win a game, he plants, I think, 5,000 trees. Not personally, mm -hmm. I think. I think he pays for 5,000 trees to be planted somewhere. So um, uh, those are my two teams. All oh, right. Well, you're, you're, you're quite busy looking at the, at the scores then at the weekend. Um, now, look, the, your first uh, song that you chose was um, f uh, classical music, interestingly, mm -hmm. uh, from Gustav Mahler. Yeah. Uh, which I am going to play now, just a short section of the 10th Symphony of Gustav Mahler, uh, um, conducted by Daniel Barenboim. Correct, yeah. <laughs> Wow, uh, that's a very uh, emotive, emotional music. Um, is Mahler one of your favourite composers? He, yes, uh, Mahler was a very complicated individual, um, very um, introspective in many ways, brilliant musician, makes you think a lot, the kind of music that he does. And he was uh, coming as he did into the 19th century and later, um, was, I suppose, the first generation of classical musician composers who didn't rely on the patronage of the super wealthy in the way that Mozart and Beethoven and their generation did. And uh, I find Mahler absolutely wonderful, but also the music, um, the way it's conducted by Daniel Barenboim. Daniel Barenboim and the West East Divan Orchestra is an amazing uh, conception. It was founded by the great Palestinian Edward Said and uh, Barenboim together, who is an Israeli. Um, they founded it as a declaration of peace, of music, of people coming together and of respect for people, their past and, and their history. Edward Said, a fantastic Palestinian intellectual, sadly, no longer with us, and Barenboim, both of them not just campaigners for the rights of people, for the end of the occupation and the settlement policy, but also against nuclear weapons and nuclear war around the world. And I think um, Barenboim uh, is it, quite amazing the way he's developed the orchestra and kept it going and to see them at the proms as they often are or anywhere else is really quite something. And the concentration of um, a predominantly young orchestra, just watching them play, I think is absolutely amazing. I like having classical music on in the background. I'm not particularly mm -hmm. musical. I just in, enjoy an absolute variety of music to listen to. And when I'm working at home or in my office, I uh, often have um, classical music mm -hmm. on, as well as lots of other music, because music is a fantastic message for us all makes us think it inspires us song and so on and so um we get a lot from it is it do you find music to be calming as well yes um music is also a memory because i think your most formative years you take in the tunes mm -hmm. of the time and you ask people of whatever their age is they always remember what was the most popular music during their sort of teenage and early 20s years and um, uh, they kind of stick with that quite a lot so i find it evoking of memory but i also find the way in which um, young people uh, can express themselves through music in a way that they um, maybe not able to in any other form because they mm -hmm. they don't see it as a good way for uh, any other form as a good way of expressing themselves and i think it's it's quite fantastic and if you listen to the lyrics of rap carefully or listen to, as we kind of come on to later to the lyrics of bob marley quite carefully or john lennon and so many others there's actually a quite brilliant encapsulation of hope, of humour, of ideas, of history, of belief, all in one song and all in a few lines. And uh, I think we can learn so much from music, which is why I was so passionate about having a 
pupil arts premium so that every child in every school would get to learn a musical instrument and every child in every school would get the chance to act and to perform so that we bring out that imaginative street that's there in children. Children write poetry and then we make them embarrassed about it when they're teenagers. Poets are the people that think and dream and thinking and dreaming helps you get lots of ideas in science, in maths as well, and in so many other areas. It's unlocking the human spirit and the imagination. It's there in all of us. Okay, well, I'm gonna move on um, to your second choice, uh, which is um, Mazes by Cole House. And this is a, a performance by uh, Jamie Branwell at a uh, rally. Well, Jamie, Jamie played it, yeah. It's, um, um, and there is Jamie himself. Look at him, in all his splendour. Well, I'll 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 play this song. Uh, I've heard it a few times. It's fantastic. Um... <laughs> Keeping you alive in the mazes of your own mind Can we get on with this for the thrill of desire? And you know when it comes it'll set you on fire You know when it comes, you'll have to walk the rope wire. There's no easy way down. At the time when you find that you're sad and all alone. There's no easy way out to pick up the phone Scared to move inside to and your mind it expands Like a massive balloon Will it hurt or go bang now There's no easy way down Will this nightmare end soon, or will it prevail? Bad sensation, realizations in detail. And there's no easy way out as this nightmare ends soon. And there's no easy way out, I'll be looking for you Cause there's no easy way down Keeping you alive in the mazes of your own mind So yeah, um, so you you met Jamie at at the uh, rally in Newcastle. Did you know him before then? Well, I know Jamie very well. Um, he's a brilliant trade unionist. He was um, one of Unite's representatives from Building Workers on the National Executive um, of the Labour Party during my time as leadership, and he's become a great friend in lots of ways. And he gets in touch with me often. He loves music. He's incredibly thoughtful and creative. And um, I was talking to him about this program that you kindly invited me to do. And he said um, he'd love to contribute something to it. And this is the music he's contributed. It is about people going through a mental health crisis. It is about people exploring themselves and their identity. And it is about the fear that people have. What's happened to me? What's going on? Where am I? What am I gonna do? How will I get out of it? What will I do? And it's that expression that music can give to people in all sorts of circumstances. And I think Jamie is just such a 
fantastic man, lovely family. And um, he and I keep in touch very regularly. He's one of these people all around the country that are doing their best to try and improve their community, work through their unions for the kind of world based on the sort of socialist principles and values that we share. So I want to say thanks, Jamie. Well, for what uh, you do. He's here. Jamie's here. Jamie. Jamie's on. Wowie. You there, Jamie? I am. Yeah. 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 I mean, uh, uh, firstly, Crispin, thanks for organising this. It's it's brilliant, and you, you and the hard work you do around the country is definitely recognised. You, you you what you do for campaigners and uh, and the activists. You, you give us and your videos. You give us that inspiration as well. So uh, we all play a part in that. Jeremy, thanks for choosing. Uh, and one of the songs from the band Coal House, uh, from the album The Tom O' Baby. Uh, we should have the, the band members Jim Burke, Dave Codlin and Steve Roberts who, who help, con who help uh, we write together all the time uh, and that's the good thing about music, it brings people together from bands but also uh, in our communities. We have a cracking community of musicians up here in H Halton where I live. Uh, Jeremy, you look. You inspired me throughout, Jeremy. Uh, your campaigning was all. You know what? What it was is you always brought up a passion of mine, which is music, uh, and you know the broken record thing that was debated in Parliament yesterday about the streaming. It was exactly when I was watching it in the Parliament yesterday. It was exactly what we had in the manifesto was 27, 2019. It was like they were reading it when I was watching the Parliament yesterday. Yeah. So. Uh, I'd just like to say thank you, Jeremy, for your inspiration and, of course, your friendship and uh, the football banter that we have when at every match when when uh, we, we get the text going. Uh, so can we we can agree on Forest Green Rovers, though, can't we? Yeah, we certainly for, uh, Forest Green, not a problem. Okay. <laughs> which, which <laughs> team, Jamie? What's your team, Jamie? Don't we're the champions, mate. Oh, I see. I know what you are. Okay. All right. Well, um, <laughs> thanks for coming on, Jamie. Thank you very much, Crispin. Thanks, Jeff. Jamie. Um, now, uh, the, the next song that you chose uh, on the list it, uh, is uh, Bob Marley. Uh, it's Buffalo Soldier. But before we play it, uh, Jeremy, I, I was intrigued about your having worked uh, in, J in Jamaica when you were younger. Mm. Uh, what, what was your experience like there? Well, amazing. Um, when I was coming up to leaving school, um, I was 18 and um, I didn't fancy going to university, but I couldn't have got in anyway on the grades I'd got. And um, I found a leaflet for voluntary service overseas, VSO, so I applied. Um, was given a really rather weird interview and um, was accepted. And then a month or so later was uh, asked to go to Jamaica to assist in a school with um, teaching, um, taking uh, young people out on expeditions and so forth. And I also did various other bits of voluntary work, including in a theater and with children who had suffered from polio and were suffering from the after effects uh, of polio. Uh, it was very strange. I was 18, suddenly plonked in front of huge classes to teach them geography. Um, and these, the boys I was teaching, it was a boys secondary school, Kingston College, were only a few years younger than me. And so it was a life changing experience in many ways. Um, I became fascinated by the history of the Caribbean and of Jamaica um, and of this was late 1960s and of their search for identity. Um, recognizing the inheritance of slavery and the brutality and vile behavior that went with it. Um, and also this incredible mixture of music in Jamaica, which was, uh, you could see African rhythms there, you could see Western European music, you could see American music in it. And at that time, we were going from ska into rock steady, into reggae, and uh, it was an absolutely incredible period. And uh, I, I loved listening to all this music. And on Independence Day, there were 
great big celebrations that's uh, august the 6th and obviously christmas and other times and so it was it was that sense of music and music of course had been something that had been very important um to slaves and that's where the origins of, of so much of it comes from that liberation that came from uh, spiritual music from gospel music and then developed into this sort of historical narrative and so um i think bob marley represents so much of that and if you listen very carefully to the lyrics of buffalo soldier uh one one thing is quite weird why would somebody write a song about buffalo soldier and then it's go listen very carefully to it a bit it came from america africa to the heart of america and then it's about how the slaves were taken there there was also of course a um, secondary sale of slaves from Jamaica uh, to the United States. So those that had um, challenged their owners on the plantations in Jamaica were sometimes effectively sold on to New York or to other parts of the USA where slavery was basically illegal, but still went on. And these slaves were, um, were taken there. And this was um, a whole process that um, inspires so much the music. And I think um, Bob Marley, such a genius in his music and um, the way he inspires young people in an incredible way. My time in Jamaica was um, two years or, or so in Jamaica, Caribbean and South America. And um, listening to that music was something that inspired me a great deal. Right. So, uh, moving swiftly along, as we <laughs> as we may need to, uh, we uh, are going to speak about uh, one of your books that you chose, um, which is by Robert Fisk, uh, "The Great War for Civilization." Yeah, R Robert died very recently, and um, as a journalist, uh, he lived in uh, Beirut and wrote for The Independent and other papers, but wrote this amazing book on the Great War for Civilization, the Conquest of the Middle East. And he has a global vision and a global breadth in his writing. And the more you understand the history, of the Middle East, of the Ottoman Empire, of the other empires fighting for space there, and the global pressures. You begin to then understand the um, corruption of many of the regimes, the conflicts that uh, are there at the present time. And Fisk explained all of this so well in his um, daily writings, but also this book, which um, is i think an incredibly good read and uh, if i'm going to be stuck on some remote place cast away and cast beyond uh, communication with anybody else i would enjoy rereading this book to give me a greater understanding of um, not just the history of, the, of that region but world history as well because i do think that we don't open the eyes of um school students and young people enough on um, the joy of learning and understanding history but also understanding how many current problems are actually framed by colonial past by illegal wars by abominable abuses of human rights such as slavery such as the holocaust all of those abominable abuses of human rights do form a great deal of our historical narrative. If we understand that, we begin to understand why the conflicts exist at the present time, and more importantly, what we can do to try and resolve them. Right, I mean, I, I, I didn't, when did he die recently? I haven't read- Very haven't, recently, yes. I haven't um, read the book myself, so I, uh, it, it's great that you've sent these in because they're a good reading list for, for me. Um, and, uh, I mean that that whole region is so difficult for me for people to understand if they you know, 
follow the news, it doesn't really give you any idea what's happened there. So I, it's, mm. it's good to know there's a book like that that you can recommend. I absolutely recommend recommend it as a, a very good read. But then also, if you take it on, also read some of the um, novels as well of the period. The novels of um, people that escaped from concentration camps and Holocaust and ended up living in Israel. Novels of Palestinian people and what they've been through and still go through because of their occupation. Because uh, sometimes a novel says more than a factual book can because people are making an observation and drawing the historical understandings from that. And so I would recommend it and I would um, certainly enjoy reading it. I try to make sure I spend some time every day reading um, beyond what I'm doing day to day because it's quite important to be active and always in search of new knowledge and new ideas. I'm surprised you have the time to, to do no, all I, I make sure I have the time. I read... Um, probably half hour, 45 minutes every night of um, whatever book I'm reading. At the moment, I'm reading The Many-Headed Hydra, which is the history of the revolutionary Atlantic, which is about the effects of the slave trade and the political ideas of both the English Revolution and of the anti-slavery movements, which came in intensity sometime after that. It's an absolutely fascinating book. And so always read something. It's good for you. Oh, good. <laughs> uh, now, uh, your next song that you've chosen is Coma La Cigala by Mercedes Sosa. Now, I had not heard of her before you um, recommended this and, and put this as your suggestion. And, and her life is fantastic, uh, amazing, incredible, uh, if you study uh, what she's done. Uh, and I'm going to play this now. I, I found that uh, on on YouTube, um, and I, I I looked up the the lyrics because um, I'm not I, I'm not fluent in Spanish at all. I tried to learn Spanish, but I failed. Um, and the the lyrics to it are incredible. Um, for it, it, it's so many times they killed me, so many times I died. Yes, I am here, rising to life once more. I give thanks to the tragedy and to the hand holding a knife because it killed me so badly, and I went on singing. Singing to the sun like a cicada, cicada, um, cic I can't say the word. Cicada, yeah. Cicada, yeah. after a year underground, the same as a survivor who returns from war. So many times they obliterated me, so many times I disappeared. I was at my own burial, alone and weeping. I made a knot in my handkerchief, but I forgot afterwards that it was not the only time, and I came back singing. So many times they killed you. So many times you will rise to life again. So many nights you will spend driven to despair at the hour of the shipwreck and of darkness. Someone will rescue you as they pass by singing. And I thought that's a bit like um, how some of the media have been treating you, but you've, you, you've managed to keep um, singing. Well, Mercedes also sadly died in 2009 amazing woman Lara and I were talking about what music inspires and um, she was very keen that we play this and I'm so pleased we did because she was an inspiration to so many people in obviously in Argentina where she comes from but all over Latin America and uh, she was uh, awarded Grammy Awards um, posthumously and she played in many places around the world and um, the best epitaph to her is her voice was the voice of the voiceless because she's in a sense was like Neruda. She, um, Chicago, lives underground, dies, but in the spring they come back in their tens of thousands. And so the Neruda poem, which says, you can cut all the flowers, but you can't stop the coming of spring. And so today, is a sad day for many people in Argentina with Maradona's death. Mm -hmm. And Maradona was a complicated person in many ways, but he also, he gave voice to the voiceless. And um, I think we should 
thank her and thank him and others for the way in which, despite all the privations they went through, the military governments, the occupation of their communities by soldiers on behalf of military hunters, the, the coup in Chile, the military regime in Argentina, Operation Condor in the 1970s that killed 25,000 people. She went through all of that and still sung for the people. Yeah, it's very appropriate what you said about Mar Maradona as well. Um, so where she caught us, really, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. So um, right. So we've got an, our next song. Oh, we've got we've got to go move on because we keep uh, we're, we're we're really um, behind on time. But um, that's uh, and the next song is is from Emily Sande um, and. She was part, uh, she did a song for the 2019 election campaign. Uh, yeah. And I think this is one, this is a song that was part of the campaign. Indeed. There you are, em Emily Sande. So, um, so, so she, she was part of the campaign and she wrote a song for the 2019 campaign. That's fantastic that she was supporting uh, Labour at that point. Fantastic song, fantastic woman, fantastic musician. I had a very long conversation with her, asking her if she would um, take part in our, uh, our campaign and sing at our music and arts launch, which we did at the Theatre Royal in Stratford in East London, and she said she would. And I think that song, You Are Not Alone, does so much to empower people, because so many people, particularly young people, feel isolated, alone and disempowered, mm -hmm. and the corona crisis makes that feeling even worse. And she's saying, you are not alone. And her life has been one of struggle, struggle against racism, struggle to get her music understood and recognised, and struggle to get it heard and get it published. And then when she does make it big, as she has, and a fantastic woman, all credit to her, she then gives it back to the community with that quality of music. What a wonderful woman. And I was so grateful to her for the support she gave us and gives everybody, because our movement is about empowering the disempowered and saying to everybody, you are not alone. Yeah, and um, your your choice as well for for the um, the next your next book choice is is also a kind of uplifting um, book from a difficult time that we're in. Um, the, a recently published book, uh, "Braiding Sweetgrass." Uh, which is yes, being, this being at one with nature, feeling more part of nature. Um, yeah. And has had, apparently had a massive response during the um, lockdown because people were kind of needing that. Yeah, it's about um, people understanding that to survive on this planet, we cannot go on destroying the planet. You have to work with nature, not against nature. And um, the indigenous cultures all around the world that have survived in the most hostile and inhospitable circumstances sustainably by working with nature and living off it rather than seeing it as a sort of permanent um, free supply of everything. It's about sustainability and I think um, we get sometimes a bit too arrogant with our technology and our science and a bit too arrogant with our use of pesticides and fertilizers and, and plastics and all, all that. Yes, we want to maintain people's standards of living. Yes, we want to um, ensure that it is equally shared. But unless we also recognize there are limits that we've gone beyond already of what you can do to this planet, then the end is uh, pretty grim for the generations to come. And that's why I think having that respect and understanding for what um, has gone before and what indigenous cultures have, have achieved is important. I find Jared Diamond's books very interesting and this one um, is also I think something that could be very instructive to us all and so the way we deal with this is not by condemning everybody because they uh, 
have a car, have a washing machine, use plastics or whatever. It is about having a green approach, a green industrial revolution that doesn't condemn people for the way in which they've been molded to live, but instead make sure that we as a society and community guarantee a life, a livelihood for everybody and we sustain our planet and our natural world. And so that is about agricultural policy, it's about industrial policy, it's about transport policy, and it's about um, sustainability of, um, of life through reducing and then eliminating pollution. Because if we don't, it's pretty grim for the future. I think the environmental revolution is what is socialism is all about. Socialism and environmental sustainability to me go absolutely hand in hand. They're the same thing. Yeah. Well, I, I was interested in that in the book, the way it talked about how um, people don't connect with nature as they did before and how we've lost that connection. And it made me think of you in a way because of what you do with your allotment and you keep <laughs> connected in, you know, even though you're in Islington uh, in, a, in, a, in the middle of London, you can still find places where you can connect. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I live in and represent the smallest and most densely populated constituency in the country. I grew up in Shropshire in, in a country area, which I loved very much. Um, but if we're to be environmentalists, and we've got to be environmentalists in densely populated urban areas. And so when my neighbours plant flowers around the trees, in the street, when we develop growing facilities on the edges of parks, when we have grow boxes in school playgrounds, when we have allotments and community gardens, then that is all beginning to help um, people understand. I mean, we've got one school just opposite my office um, is very keen on growing stuff in their school garden. They have a school garden because in years gone by, the Inner London Education Authority bought some property, demolished it, and made it into a school garden. Fantastic. And the children in the school, it's a primary school, invited me to lunch, Pools Park School lunch, and every single thing I ate was grown in their garden. And these children were so proud of it of wow. their parsnips, of their turnips, of their potatoes, of their tomatoes and their cabbage and so on. And those kids will never forget that experience of actually putting a seed in the ground, seeing it grow and beginning to understand something. We have to reconnect. Yeah. All right, well, I'm, I'm going to move on to um, the, another song. Um, it's one that my dad used to sing in the car all the time and, and uh, drive me crazy when I was a boy. Uh, <laughs> Uh, this is it. There's an old man called a Mississippi. That's the old man that I'd like to be. What does he care if the world's got troubles? What does he care if the land ain't free? Old man river, that old man river, he must know something. But don't say nothing, he just keeps rolling, he keeps on rolling along. He don't plant cedars, he don't plant cotton, then that plants them, he soon forgotten. But old man river, he just keeps rolling. Sweat and strain, body all aching and racked with pain. Tote that butt, lift that veil. You get a little drunk and your land's in jail. I get weary and sick of trying. I'm tired of living and scared of dying, but old man river, he just keeps rolling along. 
Wow, what what a voice. Um, what, a, what a man as well. Uh, are you a, a big fan of Paul Oh, Robeson? Paul Robeson, absolutely. What amazing voice, amazing story. That was from Showboat in 1936. And... Um, he suffered the racism of the United States. He suffered the color bar. He was denied a US passport, denied the right to travel because he was a member of the US Communist Party. They tried to prevent him from singing at rallies. He had to be smuggled to events and then appear on the stage and then smuggled away before the police could get hold of him. And yet he would always sing. Old Man River in Showboat was one of his greatest songs, but also the Ballad of Joe Hill, which is a favorite of so many people. And um, he came to Britain. He supported the miners in South Wales and in Scotland, and he helped them in every way that he could. He was somebody that believed in working class solidarity. And when he was eventually allowed to travel, traveled around Europe, he went to Moscow, he went to Berlin, he went to Paris, he went to London, he went to so many places. And so Robeson's voice was not just an amazing voice of an amazing actor and singer. It was also a voice of people standing up against the racism of the United States and other countries and standing up against um, colonialism. So people like him were so happy when um, Ghana achieved its independence in 1957. And Tony Benn knew Paul Robeson. He told me how he brought Paul Robeson to parliament. And um, a lot of people in parliament didn't really know very much about Paul Robeson, but they had heard he was a communist, therefore they didn't like him. And so Tony took him into the, um, Pugin room, which is a tea room, which is between the Lords and the Commons, and gave him some tea and a little table with scones and jam and all the rest of it. And he said, um, Paul, would you mind singing for us? Because Tony was ever so polite. And uh, Paul said, sure, what would you like me to sing? And he said, Old Man River. So he started singing it very quietly. Mm -hmm. And then it got louder and louder and louder. Then, then Paul stood up and sang it. And the whole room filled and all the staff came in and joined in. And the same experience happened when he sang for the Scottish miners as he did for the South Wales miners. What a guy. <laughs> Incredible story. He's in the House of uh, Commons with Tony Benn singing Old Man River. Um, and, and that actually brings me on a bit because what you were saying to, to the next uh, of your book uh, selections, which is A People's History of the United States. Um, I, no. I, looked, yeah. Go on. I looked. I looked up on. Uh, I looked. I researched it, and it seems like it was a totally breakthrough um, way of looking at history at the time when it was written, um, and has caused a lot of people to change their ways of, of of looking at you know not 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 presidents and stuff, but the real people and the real struggle. Um, is that why? Is that why you um, yeah. chose that? Well, yes, because Zinn um, wrote this book going from 1492 to the present because the history of the USA is often presented as um, it was discovered in 1492. You remember what we told in school, 1492, Columbus sailed the waters blue. And um, after that, it was civilization in the USA. And Zinn, a black man, wrote this amazing wonderful history which describes the um, Native American cultures, the indigenous cultures, describes the way in which the settlers who arrived um, later on um, were set to war against many of the indigenous peoples but also that levels of solidarity that were there and also the growth of working class movements in the United States and the struggles that they went through um, for union recognition, for strikes and against the color bar and um, for social justice in the USA. We often forget there is a massive radical history in the United States, which we're not taught about in school and don't understand. And I would like um, with the time to read very carefully Zinn's history of it Zinn's history of the cultures, all of the cultures 
of the United States and try to understand what are the great things about the United States, but also what are terrible things such as the Vietnam War and other wars that the USA has got involved with. And um, the growth of the Black Lives Matters movement is in a sense a continuation of the struggle against slavery, of the bitter struggles in the 19th century of working class America against the robber barons, and of course the growth of the civil rights movement after the Second World War. And I can think of no finer person to write this than Howard Zinn. And so I would um, enjoy reading that book. So on this castaway situation that you seem to be determined to put me into, I'll have plenty to think about and plenty to read. And I hope you're going to give me enough paper and pens to write down my thoughts about it all as well. Um, yeah, I was just thinking that when you talk about history, I mean, the, the, Margaret Thatcher's time as, as prime minister in this country has been uh, airbrushed a lot by um, historical films and, and stuff like this. Um, it, it, it's something that we have to keep alert to all the time. Mm. We need to keep representing what's actually happening so that future generations don't believe that she was this iron lady who was, you know, who was defeated by her own MPs, not by people's struggle, the struggle against her, like the poll tax stuff. And, you know, it's totally changed. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a constant thing to change the way they interpret what's happening. Yes, the, the arguments about history... Um are important and history is the most controversial of subjects because uh, you could you could present Thatcher in in lots of ways I mean personally mm -hmm. I present her as somebody that had a lot of very fundamental beliefs fundamental beliefs I do not agree with um, fundamental beliefs about destroying the power of organized labor destroying working class communities and identities and um, developing a society which was um, based on you're very clever if you can exploit the person next to you if you can exploit the whole classroom then you're a brilliant student and uh, I do remember one of her more unpleasant statements was if you're 25 and still taking a bus you're a failure in society and uh, it was that was the history of Thatcher and you've got to keep on with that remember the miners' strike and what she did then. And remember all those um, great industries that were destroyed on the altar of free market economics and monetarism. And it's that ideology of monetarism and free market economics of the Reagan-Thatcher era that we're still paying both a social and a political price for. If we are to preserve this planet, we're only going to do it by involving everybody in it. That means communities, public investment, social justice. I think it's called socialism. Right. Now, I'm going to play your next song, uh, which is uh, from uh, Maeve McKinnon, uh, yeah. and it's called Roisin Du. I've been given that as a pronunciation. Yeah. Roisin Du. So 
Wonderful. And so where, where did you hear, hear um, Rosine do from? Where did you go? Maeve and her family are very, very good friends of mine. Her late father, Alan McKinnon, was very active in peace movement, campaign for nuclear disarmament. He was a doctor in the east end of Glasgow. When he retired, volunteered to work in Liberia and um, was always supporting the worst off and, and poorest people. And um, Karen, his, his wife, his, his widow, and their children, um, Alan and Maeve are all very good friends of mine. Maeve sings in Gaelic, Scottish Gaelic, and um, the song is a translation from the Irish to Scottish, The Black Rose. And what she does is sings all over Scotland and indeed all over the world, she goes to America and other places to sing. And she's got an absolutely beautiful voice, but it's also about that cultural expression of languages that were in danger of extinction and are now coming back. And it's quite interesting, and I think she represents something of this, that in a highly communicative globalized world, there is nevertheless a growth of uh, and protection of the cultures that were in danger of losing altogether, because that sense of um, small communities, of that language that was used against the English invasion and hiding clearances and, and so on, um, and I think she is somebody that encapsulates that in the beauty of her voice and of her singing. And I want to just say thank you to her and her family for all that they do. Well, she's here. I've, I've asked oh. her. May, maybe. Are you, are you there? I'm there, here. Hi there, Crispin. Hi, yeah. Hi, hi Jeremy. Hi, Maeve. Hi. Oh, it's an honour to be included in your, your uh, castaway discs. Uh, so thank you so much for that. Um, and I'd just like to say, um, Jeremy, it was you who inspired me to vote Labour again. Um, after 14 years of being unable to, to vote Labour um, due to Blair's disastrous invasions of uh, Afghanistan and Iraq. So thank you uh, for everything uh, that you've done. And please be assured that we are rooting for you up here and we are fighting for you. Thank, thanks, Maeve. I, I know you are. And um, I always think of Alan. And um, just before we won the 2015 leadership contest, and he was, even though he was very ill, I asked him to do me some re research notes on um, peace and defence policies and so on. And he did them all and they were fantastic. And I want to thank you for your support and solidarity. And you know what? Supporting each other in lots of communities makes us all much stronger. And you're singing, you're singing in Wood Green, you're singing in Glasgow, you're singing tonight. Fantastic. Keep oh. on singing forever, won't you? <laughs> well, lots of love. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you, Maeve. Um, and, uh, I, I haven't got the next person, uh, the, ne the per person who sings the next song to come on, I'm afraid, because it's, um, it's John Lennon. Well, now, what, um, what I got from that, um, Jeremy, was um, the fact that there were loads of journalists all around his bed that that John Lennon had that power, that he could get a load of people to come round to his bed and, and he could talk about peace. Uh, it's a shame that the world's changed a bit from then. Well, John Lennon was the most zany person imaginable. And uh, I think the tragedy of his murder in uh, 1981, imagine that he was still around. Imagine is a great song, Give Peace a Chance and many, many other, uh, but, you think of John Lennon's life. Grew up in Liverpool, young guy, musician, the Beatles. Beatles then became mega, mega, mega global stars. They then broke up and he then developed on his own and did, I think, um, probably even better music on his own than he did when he was um, part of the Beatles. And uh, it was that person prepared to stand out for peace. There he was. Uh, you see films of it on the march uh, against the Vietnam War. 
um, and so many other times that he would march for peace and the way in which the uh, American um, home department spent an awful lot of time trying to stop him living in the United States. He was always about to be deported, but somehow or other managed to get yet another lawsuit and hang on a bit longer and eventually sadly died in, uh, in New York. And to me, one of the great thinkers, great poets, great musicians was John Lennon. And what a loss that he died so young because um, I think he had a lot to give and he would be such an iconic figure. Imagine John Lennon opposing Bush on the Iraq war. Imagine him opposing the other Bush on the Afghanistan war. And uh, that would have been such an inspiration to so many people, not just in America, but all over the world. And I think we should just uh, revere his life. Yeah, that's true. Um... Well, we're going to we, we, we're nearly at the end. We've got two more two more songs. Uh, have you had anything to eat? Are you hungry? No, I'm I'm okay. I we had a, lots of meetings and stuff today, and in the constituency, and then we had a very nice homemade mushroom soup in the office at five o'clock. Oh, great! <laughs> um, well, we've got our next uh, song is uh, Manifestio by Victor Hara. Yeah. And um, I, again, have learned a lot from your selection because I, I, I read about his uh, horrific um, death and also his, his um, life before that and all the, all the work that he did, all the, all the, all the music that he wrote for Allende and, and um, supporting the socialists in Chile. Um, and this was the last... Um, yeah, this was his last song before the coup in um, 1973, and he was a huge figure in folk music in Chile, and um, obviously his voice carried all around the world, and throughout the very difficult years when Allende was president in Chile from 1970 to 1973, when the Americans put a blockade on because the government, the Allende government, the popular unity government wanted to nationalize the uh, mineral resources of the country and there were shortages and there was uh, rationing and all kinds of things and Hara inspired people and so when the left were rounded up after the coup took place and Allende had been killed in the Moneda Palace the um, people were then herded into the national stadium Victor Hara amongst them and they dragged Victor Hara to the middle of the um, playing field because it's in the National Stadium. And um, he started to sing, so they smashed his guitar. Then they smashed his hands so he couldn't play his guitar. And then, even in all his pain, he started singing El Pueblo Unido, Amas Sera Vencido. The people united will never be defeated. And then they shot him and he was killed. What? an absolutely inspiring individual. And his widow, Joan Hara, made her home in England in, um, in my constituency in Kyber Road, and then went back to Chile um, after Pinochet had um, been removed from office. And I went to see her in Chile in 1990, and we went to Poblacion La Victoria, which was a very poor area of Santiago where Victor Hara had sung. And we went there at midnight and they, greeted Joan Hara. It was wonderful. Wow. I'll, I'll play um, uh, Manifestio. Very uh, an emotional listen, watching the footage uh, as well. Um, and, and to think of what happened in Chile, um, a socialist government being um, scuppered by uh, uh, the Americans and then um, an, in, an internal fascist regime, kind of makes you feel kind of, it makes me feel like, you know, if something's really someone really wants to change things then there is going to be a lot of opposition to it yeah. um and that seems to have been the experience that i've i've noted from the past 
few years in in this country um uh, would you say that um we, that these things come and go we just have to find another wave and 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 then we can um do it again we have to understand the structures of um power and the lengths to which the very rich and very powerful will go to defend that and that's why um the Allende government was so appallingly treated why um the people of Bolivia have been so badly treated, but now are reasserting themselves. And um, why we have to develop and inspire and encourage people to a different way of doing things that um, ends inequality and injustice, both within our own society and globally. Um, these are not simple issues and not simple times. But if you work on the principles, the principles of social justice, the principle that everybody deserves to make the best they can of their life, that everyone deserves somewhere to live, a health service and a school for their children to go to all over the world, then we begin to make some progress. But if instead you lay before the altar of the, mm -hmm. um, those that want a free market world, where the super rich become extraordinarily richer even more, as they are now throughout the corona crisis, and, uh, and you abase yourselves before them, then you end up destroying the gains that we've made in health, in education, in housing, and so many other things. It is about understanding structures of society, and that comes from history, and it comes from often quite simple demands. But when you win a simple demand, you're stronger as a result of it. When you built a school where there wasn't one, you're stronger because of it. When you've cleaned up a river that was foul, you're stronger because of it. And that strength can bring about a much better world for succeeding generations. And that's what I absolutely passionately believe in. And I think music is a great teacher and a great message in achieving all of this. And look at some of the songs we've had this evening. We could have had hundreds, but um, there are people that have certainly inspired me and continue to inspire me. So do you think it's like a spiritual thing as well, that the, the spirit of, of those Chileans, we, we can feel yeah. that yeah. Um, here and we can keep burning that flame of, of socialism and, and keep passing that on to yeah. um, new generations. Uh Absolutely. Rather like, rather like you talk about Tony Ben um, inspiring you, and you know you're you're inspiring others, and and then they in turn will inspire more people. Yeah. Absolutely, because the, the people of Chile went through terrible times with the uh, way in which the Americans treated them, as did the people of Nicaragua and so many other places. Yet that inspiration of what they could achieve in the longer run was what kept them going. And that inspiration came spiritually, yes, from music and, and um, other things. So it, it is about uniting people. And certainly we were talking about Victor Hara. Uh, he achieves that. And by the way, there is the Victor Hara Music Festival every year in Mahuntleth, uh, the in August every year, which is just a short time of anniversary before his death, which was... Um, in September, and I've been a couple of times to the uh, to Mahuntleth for that festival. It's amazing, Mahuntleth in Mid Wales, lovely place. Oh, I like to go there. Um, okay, so look, we, we, we're we're only half an hour late. It's not that bad, but um, we, we're <laughs> going to um, we're going to finish with an upbeat number, um, which uh, my Spanish is not particularly good. Uh, uh, the people united uh, will never be defeated. You can say that in. Spanish, can't you? El pueblo unido, a más será vencido. Right, okay. Thank you for that, Jeremy. Uh, you got me through there. Um, now, <laughs> uh, when, when this song is finished, we will be. Um, that will be the end of the the program and the show. Uh, it's not like we normally do, where we unmute everyone. But if you want to come back uh, and watch another show, we've got one on Sunday um, and we've got one next Wednesday. I'm hoping Diane Abbott will um, take up the challenge of. Um, a desert island, uh, sorry, a um, castaway cast with uh, 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 Abbott, um, maybe next week. Um, so we'll see what happens there. So thank you very much, Jeremy. Crispin, can I just say thank you to you for giving me a wonderful time.
and also for all you do to give space and inspiration to people. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Oh, it's great, great to see you. And um, we'll, we'll, um, we'll play uh, your final tune that you, you could say so well that I'm not so good at. Um...